To feel alone on this earth is a hell of a thing. I always wanted to make a 2049 video before the year 2049 rolled around, so yeah, chalk this up as a win. God knows I need one! I always wanted to make a 2049 video, but I never really knew what to say. It's a masterful cinematic work steeped in so many massive concepts and big ideas that I've always felt a little underqualified to tackle it. I'm no academic and I can't say I'm a big reader of philosophy unless you count tweets like this one. We'll get to the bottom of this one day, sir. I believe it. What I do know, though, is emotion. I understand how movies craft it, how they manipulate it and how they absorb me into it and absorb me Blade Runner 2049 does do. Every time, without fail. And that emotion isn't necessarily, uh, nice. It ain't joy or excitement or beauty that brings me to tears. No, 2049 fills me with despair, dysphoria and the ache of isolation, and that is what I want to explore. What does 2049 show me? What does it tell me that makes me feel that way? Well, hi, my name is Bailey, and this is why I love Twenty Forty Nine wastes no time in establishing that feeling, from the first production logos distorted and desaturated, we're met with this distant, echoey ambience. Our expositional text establishing the world in this tiny digital font is dispassionate, practical. Before the initial image even hits our eye, director Denis Villeneuve, my hero, has set an atmosphere. A tone from which the feeling of desolation that permeates this film will sprawl. Because at first, before we come to know our protagonist, all we see is desolation. A world devoid of colour, because it's a world devoid of life. There's industry and nothing else. The grey skies meet the grey earth with little to no distinction, and that sterile murk stretches as far as the eye can see. There are no landmarks in the rain, no features in the fog. The atmospheric density of 2049 Los Angeles is so thick that ad space is sold directly onto the smoke, breathing some kind of life and colour into the darkness with holographic neon. But that ain't life, is it? If anything, that's as bleak as life gets. Ads attacking you directly, getting all up in your shit with no say in the matter. That's dystopia right there. You exist to be sold to, and nothing more. That's why there's no artistry to this dying world. We're a long way past that. It's pure function. Blunt, brutalist, and entirely utilitarian. There's no architectural flourishes. It's only what works, or what fits. Again, industry and nothing else. And that's not to say there's no artistry in the design. No, no, no. Far from it. This is just about the most authentic and inauthentic world has ever felt, and that's no small feat. Dennis Gassner and Alessandra Caezola and the whole production design team went fucking nut nut with this, from the miniatures to the models to the cold concrete decor. There's decay, rust, erosion, all textures of a dying world beyond repair, and I believe every inch of it, whether I'd like to or not, because it's all rendered so flawlessly real. Seriously, 2049 is a film that's impossible to detect where the practical ends and the digital begins. I get it ain't dealing with aliens and other worlds, but I'd argue this is just about the best visual effects have ever been to this day. It's totally tangible, no questions asked. 
the result is the kind of world I look at and go, holy shit, looks phenomenal, but good lord, do I not want to live there? And the denizens of downtown LA don't seem to want that either. We're constantly told of a better life off world we never get to see, and all that's left behind are the sick and the poor, the forgotten. What kind of life is there for those that remain on a dying world? It's one of solitude, of cold, dark isolation, no matter who or what you really are inside. 2049 paints a picture of a world that's harsh, unforgiving, and upsettingly austere, which begs the question, why does it all look so fucking pretty? This is kind of antithetical to what this whole video is about, but fuck me dude, it is beyond unreasonable how good this thing looks. Like it's just silly, it's silly. Sir Roger Deakins, who is always on some other shit, was absolutely on some other shit here. Like, the entire New Vegas stretch of 2049 is the biggest visual Chad maneuver of the 2010s, if not the century so far. Has colour ever looked this good? I'm not sure, just wide after wide of the kind of stuff you'd frame up in an art museum. And it's not just the bold, big city vistas and aerial overheads, it's every shot. Every frame is holy shit. Like, let me just click through frames at random for a while. Bam. 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 Boom. It's all so spectacular, so arresting on the eyes, but in each of those shots I jumped through, you'll notice, I think, one defining similarity. Every frame is lonely. See, every lighting and compositional technique behind the beauty of Blade Runner 2049 has been activated for this effect. Let me walk you through this. First, and most obvious to me, is that this movie hates having two people in the same frame. Two real people anyway. Real-ish. What better way to isolate a character than to disconnect them from all others? That's why almost every conversation feels so distant, like both characters are standing an entire room apart. There's no intimacy at long range, no relationship when every shot is your own. There's so much space between us, and it's all so cold. That separation is imperative, and it extends to us too. There's no extreme close-ups, no acute moments of intensity tight to the lens. It's all shot in this same dispassionate, disengaged, near disinterested stillness set back from the subject. There ain't a handheld shot start to finish because that's a tactile technique, a visceral, hands-on effect, and this movie ain't looking for a personal touch. No, we deny touch. Touch is a sense for things, not people. A forsaken flower, a singular tree, a hidden trinket, a lonesome bee. Bees? Beads. Beads. A new shot asks for new attention and it's only ever invited to a singular sight, an object or a hand or a face. A single composition does not serve two functions, at least after the Old West opener. That's why Roger and Denis employ centre framing, silhouette, barren backdrops and big sets. That gives you contrast between character and environment, and it keeps the scenery supplementary to the man in the middle. The surroundings are sincere truthful because they're almost entirely built for real and so our characters feel real within them. But the light and costuming and styling interact in such a way that our human-ish figures are never blended into the background. It's just them standing solitary in a vast open area, detached by design from all that's around them, entirely alone in an empty frame. And... I think that emptiness, or that negative space to the sides, allows the actors to fill the frame with feeling. 
Yeah, 2049 is often sold as sterile, stringent, and emotionally vacant, but boy oh boy do I not think so. I'm running that stance all the way back in the other direction, because despair, depression, and deep existential sadness are, in fact, emotions, perhaps the most complicated we have to deal with. And just because Blade Runner is controlled in their presentation, reserved in their release, doesn't mean I don't feel every ounce of magnitude with which it investigates the ache of isolation. What's it like to hold the hand of someone you love? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do they teach you how to feel finger to finger? Interlinked. Interlinked. Do you long for having your heart interlinked? Interlinked. Interlinked. If the lonely frames of 2049 are to be filled with my own feeling, then Officer KD6-3.7 is the conduit, the activation code for the film's mode of expression. Constant K, calm, collected, and under control. Literally. He's a replicant, a man-made man made for killing his own kind, for retiring the disobedient and discontinued. And he's good at it, I guess. Efficient and compliant, a slave of the state so subservient it appears he's simply turning up for a hard day's work as if driven by a sense of duty, not programmed obligation. And yet, he's no robot, he's no simple machine. No, there's a texture there, there's a dry humour, a gentle aura, a soft-spoken kindness, and a feeling, somehow, of discontent, because, human or otherwise, Kay's life fucking sucks. Fuck off, skin job. Not only is he a second-class citizen among second-class citizens on a second-class world, but his factory-issued purpose is to execute his own people. It was one thing for Blade Runners to be human beings retiring replicants, but replicants retiring replicants is a whole nother ethical ballpark, one which doesn't rest comfortably on Kay's conscience. Because there is a conscience in there. K doesn't go home and deactivate until Judy calls. He doesn't power down. No, this is the only authentic part of his day because he gets to share it with someone he loves. Joy, his adoring, affectionate, understanding girlfriend. She asks him questions, she offers support, she's invested in his day and invested in him, something absolutely no one else on this earth is at all. And he too is invested in her, he confides in her, he's comforted by her, and he takes at least some small, uh, joy in sharing something real with someone else, making his life just that little bit less lonely. There is, however, just one small problem. She's not real. Like, at all. Joy is an entirely digital construct, an artificial intelligence without a body, a projection of light and sound onto which Kay can project his own idyllic life behind closed doors. Because Kay does envision an idyllic life for himself despite his fabricated nature. One where he is loved, one where he's not alone, and his desire for that life spurs his daily discontent. He has a yearning no programming can shake, a yearning to be real, to be human, to have a soul. You've been getting on fine without one. What's that, man? A soul. A soul for Kay would mean freedom from his designated existence. Having a soul would mean the option, the ability to rebel, to forge his own path beyond the one laid out for him to be more than a serial number with a role to play. But what constitutes a soul? What qualifies a human being? For K, to be real is to be human. You arrived here by nature and your experiences navigated from birth will shape you over time. Your memories. You know your life is real because you lived it for yourself from the very start. The Nexus 9 replicants, ones 
like K, are given manufactured memories and told they aren't true. They exist to inspire simulated emotional response, the impression of discovered thought and feeling, imitating the process of consciousness just as you and I know it. What they have in their heads are simply stories they tell themselves, authored by another. All of this amounts to an existential conflict inside of Kay. He knows with certainty that he is not real but he wishes with every part of his synthetic self that he was. He wishes more than anything that the stories inside of him were true. So what if they were? What if in a detective story where the detective desires nothing more than being at the center of the mystery, the existence of a child born of a replicant in secret, what if R.K was that child. I always knew you were special. To be special is to be something more, something greater, something unique and unprecedented, something you cannot replicate. To be special is to be everything K has ever wanted. To be that child means he was born. It means he has a soul. It means he possesses the power to forge his own path, the autonomy to make his own decisions. It makes his feelings, the confusion, rage, love, entirely real. They are his own from authentically within. So what now? Now that you know your life is a lie, that you aren't the thing everyone said you were, the thing you believed yourself to be, what comes next? <laughs> well, you find the liars that were supposed to love you. I've never known a film to activate again over halfway through like 2049 does. Once K is on the run, every gear in this thing engages in a mighty surge forth into the unknown. It's not that things weren't perfect before, but this is next level now. Our hero's world has been flipped upside down, or maybe right way up, and the entire form of the film shapeshifts into something more momentous thereafter. And almost immediately the momentum breaks, for the greatest sequence in the film no less. I want to be real for you. You are real for me. Here we have it folks, one of probably my 10 favourite scenes of all time, and I can barely explain to you why that is, or exactly what role it serves in the wider context of the movie. Something about our first display of real human touch, perhaps, skin on skin, lips on lips, real intimacy experienced by a real person, a breakthrough for Constant K in his journey of knowing his true nature. But at the same time, it's still so inexplicable to me. It's five minutes of pure feeling, and maybe that's the exact response it's after. It's that proximity to something honest and tangible and sensually interlinked without ever actually being any of those things, and I'm experiencing that as one with Kay, just as Joy is one with Mariette. Okay, let's do it. Just fucking... Gah, the tremble on this shot, what are you doing to me? Kay's quest for answers to his origin next draws him out to Nevada, and good lord Roger, every time buddy, oof. Out there in the radiated desert, inside the derelict remains of a sprawling casino, Kay finds the last piece of the puzzle. Maybe less a piece than a person, or what's left of them anyway. His father. I didn't happen to have a piece of cheese about you now. Would you boy? Rick Deckard, our gruff, grumbly protagonist number one, out there alone in the remnants of Las Vegas. 
Thriving? Maybe. Unbothered? Not anymore. Because while Kay got the reunion he required with the man he never knew, one-sided as it was, as well as his first insight into the mother he'll never know, he also leads love right to them. Ah, love. What a character. The dark mirror of Kay, another Nexus 9 assembled to serve, yet yearning to feel love, to be loved. She's suffering from that same isolated feeling that Kay knows all too well, that disconnect from all that surrounds her, but her subjugated relationship to mogul Neander Wallace has her express that longing for something more as a quest for employer validation. Both Kay and Love aspire to be more, to be special, but where Kay seeks it in a family unit, Love pursues it in praise from her creator. The best angel of all. Aren't you, Love? Maybe she really does see Wallace as a father, but to him she's no more than his sharpest tool in a belt of millions, an expendable plaything that can be replaced, and knowing that has made Love cruel, competitive, and intensely vindictive. Stop! She could have just walked away here, she had what she needed, but to hold power over another, to know you can extinguish existence at will, that's what it is to be the master, to be Wallace, so why not feel that for yourself? I love you. In a matter of minutes, Kay racks up every single L he possibly could. Deckard is captured, Joy is obliterated, and he's left bleeding out a good 30 floors up. That's a lot of pain in a lot of ways in a very short window, and even if the Replicant Revolution rescues him before he fades to black, the pain doesn't end there. Not yet. Because there's still one final blow to be dealt, the most tragic one so far. One that flips the entropy of 2049 for a third time. You are not the child. You are not human. You are not special. You imagined it was you. I am not human. I am human. I am not human. I am not special. I am special. I am not special. What does that do to a mind that much lost that fast? You have no job, no lover, no parents, no identity. You have no place in this world. You are not real. You are nothing. You're adrift in the void of reality and the ache is worse than ever. Even the yearning you felt for all that, for a soul able to love and be loved, even that was not exclusive. Over the course of his investigation, Kay built himself up from a factory-issued nobody to a being that broke the world simply because he never asked the right questions. He didn't want to. He got his first taste of hope for something more and held onto it for dear life, riding the confirmation bias all the way to being a real boy. But he's not. He never was. He's just your average Joe. The real boy needs a real name. Joe, the name given to him by Joy. Joy, now lost to digital oblivion. Erased forever, unable to be restored or replicated. You look lonely. And that's the final twist of the knife, a reminder at rock bottom that the love you so desperately wanted to believe in was nothing more than a program designed to fill the void inside of you, to help heal the ache at your very heart. Everything you want to hear. 
all Kay ever wanted to hear was that he was real, that he was special, so that's all Joy ever told him. Every bit of evidence, every new development in the case was a sign pointing towards his true identity, if approached from the right perspective. Or the wrong one, I guess. Joy never lied to him, she couldn't have, but she offered him love in its easiest form, validation. And 2049 seeks to make it clear just how destructive that can be. Look where that kind of love left love. No, 2049 knows that real love, honest love, is hard, composed of challenge and adversity. Real love requires us to hurt in order to help others. It requires sacrifice, a forfeiting of the self for someone else. And so, as he stands there in the rain, mourning the loss of all he believed himself to be. Broken, defeated, and overwhelmed more than ever by the ache of isolation, Kay finds a cause. Blade Runner 2049's biggest question, I believe, isn't what makes us real. There is no concrete answer to that, no definitive resolution, and the film never tries to give us one. Because it doesn't actually matter. It never did. Being here is enough to be. Kay is alive, authentically or otherwise, and in being alive his reality is no less true than that of any other. What does matter, though, is that if we are here, in whatever form that takes, we find a way to overcome the ache of isolation. Dying for the right cause is the most human thing we can do. We each arrive here on this earth, alone, and journey forth across time as one, in one reality, from one point of view and we journey forth until our time is through, and time consumes us, and forgets us, and we forever cease to exist. The burden of all things that are here is the knowledge that they one day won't be, and that the process of personal extinction is one that we must face in solitude, as individual entities. This is the ache. This is where it comes from, and what it means. It fills us each with a little sovereign sadness, a dormant despair that taints all else around it, and I'm not sure it can ever be defeated. But we can drive it back. We can find a way to navigate the march ahead so that it feels just that little bit less empty, and we can do it through self-ordained purpose. Because purpose is all any of us are really looking for, isn't it? A reason for today. We're all just waiting out the clock, so why wake up in the morning? We are our own masters. Purpose, a cause to fight for, something to chase, something to aspire towards, something to fulfill, something outside of the self that doesn't come too easy, that asks you to reach beyond the bounds of you. And it doesn't have to be extreme or all-consuming. Purpose doesn't have to take a lifetime to achieve. It can be little things that mean a lot. Something today, something tomorrow. Something like a simple act of service to someone else. Go meet your daughter. Here at the end, with nothing to his name and no one that cares for him, Kay finds purpose in doing right by someone else. He might have lost everything he thought he was, all understanding of why he's here and where he's going, but there is always always another thing to hold on to. And so he holds on and gives Anna the moment he so desperately wanted for himself. 
the chance for a child to meet the parent they never knew. A moment real and true and human. A moment deeply special. And as he lays dying for the first time in the entire film, Kay doesn't feel disconnected. Out there in the falling snow, he might be alone, but Deckard isn't, Anna isn't, and he made that happen. He drove back desolation with a radical act of unrequited love, the only thing he had left to give, because when all else leaves you, Love is the one thing that remains inside, and giving it to others without condition is the most human thing we can do. Our time on this earth will end one way or another, and all we can do in the space between is love each other completely before we all melt away like tears in the snow. Whoa! Take a moment. Breathe. Man, am I proud of this one. Thank you for being here. We are now well and truly back online and entering what I like to call the trench run because I honestly don't know how long I'm going to keep doing all this. Like, hopefully a long time still, but if this is to be my last run of videos, I'm going big and bold and making every video y'all have ever asked for and every video I've put off for way too long videos like this one, because if I am approaching the end, I want it all out of my system and in your hands forever. If you don't want what I do here to end though, spread the word, help me out, subscribe, hit the bell, let me know what you've always wanted to see from me, let me know what you thought of the video you just saw. I want to give some extra love to my world class Patreon supporters, you are so real for what you do, I love you, I'm going to be back again with another why I love before too long, and man. I hope to see you there. Love always from me and empathy first. <laughs>